Hi, I'm Dr. John Duyard, and welcome to this month's Life Spa podcast. And it's February. In honor of Valentine's Day, I thought I would talk about true love and how to detoxify the emotions that block it. You know, I give a lot of seminars around the country, and I always ask the question, do you love your partner, spouse, husband, wife? And everybody says, oh, yes, 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 I do. And I say, well, do you ever find yourself holding back loving them fully. Everybody thinks for a minute and they go, yeah, that's me, I do that. And uh, so there's this uh, question begging to be asked, why, if you love them fully, do you hold back? What is it that makes us feel not safe enough to love them fully? And this is based on old emotional patterns that uh, are survival-based that we carry from childhood into our adult, and these impressions are literally written into the white matter of the brain. We know how this works from the Ayurvedic perspective. You feel hurt in your heart, it's called sadhaka. That sadhaka, uh, which is the feelings and impressions we have, it carried through what's called pranavata um, to the brain, to an aspect of the brain uh, called tarpakakapha. And the pranavata literally scribes in these impressions in the white matter of the brain. In the, in the waxy myelin, she scribed in there saying, this is a stress and the nervous system is acutely aware of anything that resembles that stress moving forward and it's for species survival. So anytime that you feel unsafe, you're going to clam up and wall off and protect yourself, armor up. So when I love my spouse, husband, wife fully, and I don't get anything in return, then that could be devastating. It's too risky. I'm going, if I go way out on that limb and I don't get my response, then I'm gonna feel hurt, foolish, embarrassed, and uh, therefore I don't take that risk. So I constantly test the water of true love. Rarely do I jump in. So, so this is an interesting kind of phenomena and it's something that we have to break because if you love the person fully, then love them fully. And the reason we don't do it is because we are conditioned to get our love from everyone else. We have a tendency to manipulate our environment, the people around us, to do what we think they should do so then we feel approved, appreciated, and important. And, and we spend a lot of energy manipulating other people to love us. And then that love makes us feel good, you know? Um, but there's, an old, there's a really good study that I've talked about in the past, and it's when people gave uh, uh, love or a gift with an expectation to get something in return. It's called eudaimonic or hedonistic giving, where you give with, you hope that they like it and you hope you get a gift back when it's your birthday or whatever. There's an expectation there. And then another group gave a gift eudaimonically, which means I don't really care about a gift. I don't care. I don't need a return on investment. I don't need anything. I just love loving you with a big fat period at the end. I don't need anything in return. No expectation, no fruits of the action. And uh, when they gave hedonistically with an attachment, it had a negative effect on the genetic code. When they gave in a positive way, it had a positive effect on the genetic code. So when you are manipulating someone to love you, appreciate you, approve of you, say nice things about you, they can tell on a genetic level that it's not you, it's not real. It's your mind engaged in manipulation to make me do something that you want. But when I give you a gift in a eudaimonic way from my heart, from my soul, it penetrates all the armor. And it drives really deep. And the person who I'm giving to can tell it's real. And they feel then safe enough to open up their heart and give themselves fully to that person. Because you didn't go in there with a hook. You didn't go in there with an agenda you went in there with true love. When you go with an agenda, it's like hitting a wall. That person realizes at a subtle level, it's not real, it's not safe, don't open the doors. But when you give fully, eudaimonically, they don't have any choice but to let it all in. And they feel safe in that sunlight. 
open to open up the delicate petals of their flower and let who they truly are out, right? This is called true love. I feel safe enough to give myself fully to you. That makes you feel safe enough to open up your heart and feel safe enough to give yourself fully to me. This is a communion, a relationship based on true love, based on the truth, right? And, you know, with Valentine's Day coming, it's a great idea to think about how you can love fully, how you can tap the water of true love, as opposed to continually engaging in unconscious behaviors based on manipulating your environment to get you a temporary sense of well-being, feeling approved, appreciated, you know, important for the moment. But shortly thereafter, because you don't have that lasting connection, you're looking for another source of satisfaction, another source of uh, approval and appreciation. And this is never going to work. So true love is based on tapping into something that's really real. You know, one of my favorite techniques for figuring that out is to you know, take a, a, a pen and a paper and write a, a love letter to your husband, spouse, partner, wife, whatever. And, um, and write down all the things that you love about that person. I love because they're so nice to me and they're always there for me. They got my back. They're my best friend, my partner in life. I can trust them, whatever it all is, you know. And I know that there's going to be a lot of things that they do that, that you don't like. They don't, you know, take out the trash. They don't close cupboards. They don't clean their this or that. That's okay. We're just writing a love letter here. So write the love letter about the things that you love about that person and make a nice list. And here's the key. As you make that list, ask yourself, how does it make you feel when you write that love letter? Does it make you feel expanded or contracted? So when you write about the love, if it makes you feel good, warm, fuzzy, appreciated, approved of, you know, happier, more expanded in some way, it's the truth. Which then, all we have to do then is take action based on the thing that made you feel so good, right? So a lot of us engage uh, in this kind of manipulation kind of relationship where, you know, I'm constantly trying to get them to do what I think they should do. And they can tell it's not you. So they react to that by closing up. So when you engage in a behavior to manipulate them and they don't respond the way you think, it pisses you off. And it makes, you, it makes it sort of difficult, right, to sort of give fully to them because they didn't, give what you, they didn't give you what you wanted. So they're close because they could tell hedonistically that wasn't real. So I'm walling you off on some subtle, non-spoken level. And I didn't get what I needed, so I'm going to wall off. And now we just go further apart. And the manipulation grows in the relationship. And soon, and then, you know, once in a while, you figure out how to get connected because you, you're like-minded and you're in partnership and you figure out a way to get through it. But there are always these molecules of emotion stuffed away, pre-recorded stress responses where if they ever do anything that triggers those old records that we wrote in the white matter of my brain, in the Tarpaka Katha, boom, I react in that emotional way. I mean, it's sort of like funny. You go home for the holidays, right? And then you start acting like a two-year-old again or a four-year-old or an eight-year-old again. And you wonder, what it is it that my family does to make me so crazy? And that's because there's pre-recorded stress responses, molecules, emotions stored in your fat cells. And when, you, and when you energetically bump up against that stress, boom, we respond without even realizing we're responding in that way. So it's kind of a really interesting thing. So the key is when you write that love letter and what you write about makes you feel warm and fuzzy and wonderful, all you got to do then is act on it. Take that list and think of ways to engage your partner based on the things that you love and appreciate about them. This is a great month to do that, right? It's a month where you really celebrate love, true love. You know, not, you know, just buying them something that you think that they're going to like, so then they feel good about you, and then you feel, you know, good about yourself because you made them feel good. This is not really how it works. There's one day of everybody's happy because they got a nice gift. 
but we're talking about lasting love. And that means digging in through the pain to the deeper parts of our truth. You know, using the relationship that you have as an opportunity to feel safe enough to move through the pain and access a deeper part of who you truly are and let that out. You know, when you have a relationship in partnership, there's clearly in that, by definition, there's a trust involved. There's a level of commitment involved. There's a level of surrender involved that puts you on a place where you feel, you know what? In that, on that platform of this relationship, I can take some risks because I know they're not going anywhere. I know that they're my, my life partner and I feel pretty secure in that relationship. But there's a lot of obstacles and bumps in this road. We don't get along a lot. I have my yoga practice and my spiritual practice and my husband, he just watches the game and drinks beer and my gosh, that's, and we're just on different spiritual paths. You know, we're just not the same and that's never gonna work really. But we get along and we're partners and, but we're not really the same. And, 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 I, and I really think that's not true. I, I think that, you know, when you walk into the room and you walk through the hallway and the husband's watching a basketball game and drinking a beer in front of the TV or having dinner in front of the TV or whatever, and you're not approving of that, I guarantee you they feel it on a subtle level and maybe not even on a subtle level. They feel that. So they retreat a little bit. He's sitting there going, yeah, God, I know I probably should not be watching the game right now and I should probably not be drinking a beer and, you know, and I should probably, you know, sit down with her and talk with her all about the day and have conversation and communicate. And he knows that. Um, but he also wants to watch the game. It's the big game, you know. And, uh, and uh, so he walls off and then, then you know, you feel um, when you see him again, there's a little bit of resentment that you have towards him and he's retreated and you're feeling that retreat that you created and then you feel that as him while, and pulling back even further when the game's over and you're trying to have a conversation. I wrote an article once about your emotional footprint, you know, and when you walk into it, I always think of the analogy like in a Disney movie, you walk into a, a garden and you know, are all the little flower buds and the plants and flowers and animals and everything in the garden, are they seeing you coming and running away and constricting and retreating or, or are they seeing you and opening up waiting to greet you because they feel safe with your presence, right? So a lot of times what happens is your emotional footprint, you could create an impact when you walk through the room and you kind of give him a look that he felt watching the game and he walls off and then when you see him next he's a little bit timid and kind of walled off and restricted and you're then judging him for that that you created right and that can happen days later like you could do something to someone and hurt their feelings because you were sort of upset about them that created an impact on them where they retreated and contract and constricted their emotions and then days later, you're wondering why they're not being nice to you. And it's because you're still somehow trying to figure out a way to, to feel safe enough to love you again because of what you did, but you didn't even realize you did it because it's an old habit. A lot of times just manipulating someone uh, is uh, not perceived the way we think. Anyway, it's sort of an interesting dynamic to think about, right? That, you're, you're, that when you see someone acting in a way that's not the way you want them to act, before you say, what's wrong with them? You might think for a second, hmm, did I have anything to do with this? And how can I take responsibility for that if I did? And that comes with communication, you know, you know asking them, hey, you know, have I, have I hurt your feelings lately? I, I feel like I might have, you know, crossed the line. Because usually if you did that, you probably know <clears throat> that you did it. Sometimes you're surprised how, how um, unaware we can be um, and how, how we can, you know, stomp on people's emotions like in the garden and not realize that we did that. Um, and this is where heightened awareness comes in. It's quite beautiful. 
So that's one piece of the puzzle. I want to build on that. But there's there, a lot of these, these, these little subtle aspects of our relationship are really due to um, old pent-up emotions, patterns of behavior we created as young children to be safe and secure, which is important. But we continue to project them on the screen as adults. And we end up doing the same dumb thing again and again and again. And it's our program. It's what we do. We're just, we're just you know, aggressive or we're just you know, uh, you know, insensitive or we just don't seem to recognize what people feel. Uh, and that's just how we roll. And that's how we do it. And so, the, so the, the point of this, the first step in this is to start to create some self-awareness. So you can see you know, more clearly some of those old patterns of behavior. There's an old saying, my favorite, that says, to the extent that something affects you is to the extent that it's your karma. So um, to the extent that someone or something affects you is your karma, which means action, means if something is bothering you, then the opportunity is for you to take action. So if you walk into the room and they're not being nice to you, then the opportunity is for you to take action to free yourself from letting that affect you. We want to be weatherproof from these bad, unwanted emotions. And the way to do that is to, be, is to take you know, responsibility. So to the extent that something affects you, it means that you have to then dig in with your own self-awareness. I always like to think of it as pulling back the bow, holding the bowstring perfectly still. The lake becomes perfectly calm and clear. You can see into the depths of that water. You can see clearly old emotional patterns that may have actually impacted the other person. And then you take action to free yourself from that pattern. And that comes with going back to your letter that you wrote that says, these are all the things that I love about this person that make me feel wonderful when I think about them. So how can I take action on those things that we actually have proven are truthful because they expanded us? So that's one of the mechanisms that you can do is in the heat of battle, when something affects you in a negative way, you must take action based on the truth. So that letter gives you a template of what's real and true about the relationship. It's kind of quite, quite cool. So you can always go back and go, yeah, they did this crazy thing, but you let it go by, and then you, you act from this place of compassion and understanding. Um, in relationship, um, so much stems on us having an awareness of why things are happening. You know, instead of looking through the window of judgment, we look through the window of compassion and understanding. If someone's being mean or hurtful to you, there's a really good chance that they were hurt. And their reaction of being mean and hurtful is because they're in protective mode. You know, a rose <clears throat> uh, has thorns to protect them. I always say that at one point roses didn't have thorns and everybody ate them and trampled them because you can eat rose petals, right? And then one day one of the little roses said, this is crazy. I mean, look at the pricker bush. Nobody even goes near them. And we just get trampled daily, eaten daily. What if we just grew a few thorns? You know, that would be like so cool. And they ended up doing it. They took a vote, I think, and they ended up growing thorns and now nobody tramples rose bushes anymore. It's tricky to eat them. Um, so when someone's been trampled in their life, they're going to become a little thorny in their behavior. And they may throw some darts at you. They may irritate you. They may hurt you. And if you look through the window of judgment, you can just, yeah, they're bad. Push them away. Or you can look through the window of compassion and understanding. And if you go through that window and act on it, because now you pull back the bow, you look deeper into the cause of this. You looked into the depth of the water and go, oh, there's something underneath this I didn't see. They're not just mean, they're hurt. So now I can take action based on that, you know, good, interacting to them with compassion and understanding is something they would never expect. But because it's true, it's eudaimonic giving, it unlocks their armor and they all of a sudden are exposed and vulnerable in a way to let something more real out of them. And now we have the beginning of a true love relationship. It's a beautiful, beautiful, simple, simple concept, you know, and these old emotions, unfortunately, and depending on how stressed our childhood is, we really carry them, you know, and, 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 and cherish them uh, in, in, in our adult lives. <clears throat> and they can 
really wreak havoc on our, on our relationships in our life in, in a big way. And Ayurveda was all called that, becoming un, being unconscious. And the goal of Ayurveda was to become conscious. And they, they actually even talk about this on the most subtle levels. And, and this is, might be a little bit too uh, subtle for, for some of you, the listeners, but in Ayurvedic medicine, the, the subtle energy um, are, are very, very real. And in fact, in Ayurvedic medicine, the more subtle something is, the more powerful it is. Um, the microbiome, for example, you can't see the little bugs in there, but they are powerful. They're running the show. They're the ones that make you crave, you know, you know, Dairy Queen or, or you know, some candy cake or whatever it might be. Um, they're, they're the ones involved in that craving because they want to be fed that and they're sending messages to your brain and say, feed me that. That's how that works. You can't see them, but they're running the show. Um, so in Ayurvedic medicine, the, the more subtle these things are, the more powerful. So there are these subtle energy pathways and they're called nadis in Ayurveda. And as you grow up from being a young child to a teenager to a mature adult, you move through levels of, of uh, maturity of the whole nadi subtle energy system. And one of the ways that that happens is this, this, this energy uh, that resides when you're young in the base of your spine in the sacrum, that's why they call it sacred, um, sac sacrum from the word sacred, um, there's an energy there that is going to mature and find its way through the spine. And there are subtle energy pathways that, the spiritual energy, that make us more aware of a higher power, interested in a higher power, in spirituality. And, um, and uh, these nadis, uh, there's six of them actually that are, that are talked about in Ayurvedic medicine. And not all of them go directly to the higher centers and give you, you know, access to a spiritual life and a happy life. They can, based on emotional trauma, they can be derailed. And there's one nadi that's called um, Vajra nadi, which, which uh, doesn't even start from the base of the spine. It starts from the sex center. And it goes not to the top of the head where the, where the, where the spiritual centers are. It goes to some of the base centers of the brain where the sexual centers are. So it makes people um, uh, very, very ad potentially addicted to sex. And of course, sexual energy is huge, right? It's a big, huge energy. And um, very easy to glue sex and love together. And that's what happens when this is the rising that you have, is you begin to have this, this, uh, this uh, uh, gluing of thinking that love is sex and sex is love, and they're not. Um, love is what I just talked to you about, is feeling vulnerable enough to let something so delicate and so sensitive and so vulnerable out that it's the most powerful thing on this planet. Sex is an act, a physical act that releases hormones that gives you pleasure. It's a big difference. Now, sex can be an expression of love, absolutely, but sex and love are not the same thing. So it's very important to realize that, but our culture sort of didn't get that memo. And now we have a whole culture where everything is sort of sensual and sexual and we sell things that way and everything is, you know, sex sells, right? And uh, we, our senses don't have much of a choice than to be exposed to that, be affected by that, and to be, you know, uh, addicted or att attracted to sex as a way of pleasure. And then soon sex and love become glued together. Uh, it's really a whole thing in our culture today with, with the internet and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the instant gratification that you can get on the internet uh, through social media and different, different venues like that, that it becomes a lot easier to have um, superficial relationships and not so deep anymore. You know, when I was a kid, right? You know, when I wanted to date a girl, there was no choice to, except for to pick up the phone and call them, you know, the old fashioned way. And the problem was, is that usually my parents were in the other room acting like they weren't listening, but they were. And their parents were probably in the other room and you knew they just picked up the kitchen phone and were having this conversation, which was so incredibly awkward and so incredibly hard. You know, and, and kids today don't have to go through that, that 
that the emotional kind of obstacles to get to know someone on those deeper levels. It's just easier to just, you know, change the channel, if you will. And uh, so it's harder in, in this culture for kids to have that relationship of true love. And I'm hoping that the pendulum of our sensory stimulation, our need to be approved of and appreciate from the outside world, that pendulum has swung so far that people are, well, we have epidemic levels of depression and suicide. Kids are having a real trouble with anxiety. It's a real issue. And I think the pendulum has to swing back. You know, I wrote an article not long ago called Religion is, not religion, but God is back, right? And scientists have spent the last couple of decades telling us that there is no God, it's all science, it's all, it's all physics, it's all, you know, mathematical, and there's no God. Well, now the physicists are telling us, mm, might have jumped the gun on that, that these unified field, zero-point field theories are intelligent, that these fields are informed. This is not new information. Max Planck, the father of quantum physics, Einstein, they all said the field was spiritual, that there was something informed, and, and there was a, a, a godliness to this universe. The creation is impossible for it to be random, which is what science was trying to tell us. But the science now tells us that it's impossible for it to be random. They say it's like equivalent to like having a hurricane run through a junkyard and assembling all the winds, assembling a working, perfectly working airplane, and then you get up and fly it. That would never happen. And that's exactly why these fields are informed. So we have, we have these fields <coughs> that are truly informed and they are intelligent. And um, so that's, it's, a, it's a, a, a beautiful understanding of how true love um, really works and how um, we can have relationships that are really, really deeper, deep, much more deep. And, and taking that risk to go through the pain and the fear is really, really critical. And our infatuation with the outside world, hopefully that pendulum will swing and we'll start to then become more um, fascinated by our inner space versus only the outer space. And our senses, our avenues of consciousness, they go both ways. They really do go out really well, and they bring in all kinds of joy and pleasure. But, you know, from the Vedic perspective, this is, a, this is all for the purpose of the soul. And from, the, from that perspective, we have to look and see, what is the soul's purpose for pleasure? What's the soul's purpose for wealth? What's the soul's purpose for having all these things? And it's to become, realize that, yeah, they're great, but they don't completely fill me up. You know, I've, you know, I treat a lot of wealthy patients over the years and, you know, I guarantee you wealth was never the solution for happiness and joy. That just was not the answer. It has to do with, to the extent that it affects you, to the extent that it's your karma, which means opportunity to take action, transformational action, to free yourself from old underlying emotional patterns of behavior and become conscious and become free. And when you start to use those rules, um, it's just a great way. So in your relationships around Valentine's Day, you know, the way to, the way to kind of redirect those subtle energies, those nadis, into the appropriate pathways in your spine called shishumna that goes all the way to the spiritual centers of your brain is to act on the truth of you. And that's Ayurveda. Ayur is life, Veda is truth. It means let the truth of you out. Of course, it means the science of life and living in harmony with the natural cycles. Ayurveda is about getting your body, this instrument, into balance so it can be balanced enough, clear enough, aware enough to perceive the subtle, the subtle energy. When you hurt somebody, if you're aware at a subtle level, you can never do that. The Ayurvedic people were so aware, they knew that if you actually were aggressive with picking and harvesting your plants and carrying it to the market and throwing it on the table, that it would affect the energy in some way of that food. And now we have science to show that if you are aggressive with the microbes on the food, that it would actually change the microbes. And when you eat that food, that food's been altered or stressed by your intention. And they have mechanisms for that. They're called biophotons. These biophotons are, are, are photons that we admit out of our body and receive from, out, from other people, you know, constantly. 
But these biophotons, these subtle energy particles, are affected by our intention. And so when you have an intention, they change the energy of the, the plant. The microbes carry that information and they transmit that information to us. When you eat those food, if there was enough stress on that plant to genetically alter it, there's a process called horizontal transfer of genetic material where the bugs from the, from the food that you ate, the genetic material is transferred to your genetic material to help the species survive. That's what it's all about. So if the bug's getting sprayed with glyphosate for weeks and months or years on end, eventually that's going to get to our genetic code and we're going to become somehow aware or prepared for the onslaught of glyphosate so it doesn't take out the species. So all for species survival, right? So it's really a, a, beautiful, um, a beautiful understanding. And that understanding is the microcosm. But on the macrocosm, it also works. This body of ours, this instrument of ours, is a radio antenna to perceive, receive, and transmit consciousness. And I mentioned those zero-point unified fields that are in form. They call them the Akashic fields in Ayurveda that store all the information. And these fields even predated our space and time because they predated the Big Bang. And that's when space and time started. And these fields were there before that. And they know that now. And they also know that the universe is evolving, just like we're evolving. And we're evolving from the bugs we eat, which are our little feedback guys out there telling us all the crazy stuff that's happening. They, we eat that food and that becomes our genetic code and we stay, we evolve ahead of the curve of extinction, hopefully. In the exact same way in the macrocosm, our human consciousness, our thoughts are being uploaded into that zero point unified field, intelligent informed field. And we also download information from that field. So all of our collected thoughts, and that's a scary thought, are helping this universe, these fields that, that pervade everything, evolve. So the universe is evolving. And we are uploading and downloading information from that. So we are connected at the higher level. But that's all, again, that's really super subtle stuff. And if our instrument is like, you know, we've got digestive issues and heartburn and pain and all these things, emotional trauma, we're not going to have the ability to perceive that. Like I said, it's all about the journey of the soul. And the soul is that part of us that, you know, when they talk about in the Bible, eternal life and these things, that never ends, right? This part of us continues. And, you know, a lot of the Ayurvedic understanding is that if we can become a more refined instrument, to perceive that subtle impressions of the soul, we could become a, you know, a, a, a realized passenger on the journey of the soul and not just be like all about, you know, food and money and power and fame. Well, this incredible subtle thing on the level of our spirit is taking place without us even knowing it's happening. That's Ayurveda, that's human potential, and that's what we have access to. And that's what they wrote about in the Vedic text. That's the whole point. So, and when you get that level of sensitivity and awareness, you're content at a level that, you know, is much different than just getting stuff from the outside world. You're fully content. You're weatherproof. You don't need stuff to feel happy. You're happy for no reason. It's who you are. You know, that's the beauty of it. So in a relationship, you're not needing anything from that relationship. You don't need love from them. You become love because that's who you are. And they feel so safe in that sunlight. They feel safe enough to open the petals of their flower. And now we have something called true love, which is quite magical. But how do you get rid of all these emotions that block it? That's the key, right? How do you get rid of all that emotion that we now know, molecules of emotion uh, discovered by Candice Purd, PhD from NIH, found that these molecules of emotion store in the muscle and the fat and they are pre-recorded stress responses that make us think and do the same dumb stuff again and again and again. Ayurveda called it mental ama. And that ama, again, stored in the fat. And we need to get rid of it. 
So there's a lot of ways to do it. I want to share with you some ways, and I'll kind of point you to some articles to go deeper if you like, but there's a lot of ways to get through that. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of those ways um, is uh, um, understanding that when you write those impressions into the white matter of the brain, the waxy myelin sheath, they're scribed into sort of a waxy myelin sheath. And what was interesting about uh, when I did the research on a lot of the Ayurvedic breathing techniques and meditation and chanting, they all changed what's called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is the ability to, to, that the brain is plastic and it can be molded any way that you want based on facilitated thoughts or neural pathways. So if you use vibration, you could literally help support a new vibration that could sort of, well, if, let's say if you took your hand, you took a, a, a tray of sand and you wrote your name in it, then you shook the sand, it would be gone. Your name would be gone. In a similar way, vibration techniques and bringing more oxygen into the tissues are ways to accomplish that. And these are why, this is why breathing techniques and yoga breathing meditation are so critically important because they're transformational not just to be flexible, you know, and meditation isn't just to be a, is not just a stress response or a stress reduction technique. None of that's true. Yoga was not for your physical body, you know, and, and meditation wasn't just to, you know, help you get rid of stress from a hard day. These were techniques to raise our vibration. So we vibrate at a higher level that could erase old mental, emotional patterns of behavior written in the white matter of the brain vibrate them out in a way, you know? So it's a really beautiful thing. So what's interesting is, like, I was always thought, like, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been involved in chanting, but if you've ever been, um, you know, Gregorian chants or all different types of chanting, there's something special about it. Well, that vibration, you know, is a vibrational tool that helps to kind of erase some of the old emotional patterns scribed into the waxy myelin sheaths and it allows you to rewrite those programs based on the letter that you wrote, which was all based on what? This is what makes me feel good in relationship with this person, so I'm going to choose to act on that, as opposed to choosing to not act on that and act on engaging in behavior that's trying to get them to do what I think they should do. Let that go. Do you, don't do them, and watch them feel safe in your sunlight, and all of a sudden the relationship changes because now you're engaged in a relationship based on true love. It's real, not fake. Remember the hedonistic giving. They can tell when you're full of it. When you do it eudaimonically, it goes right through the gate, and next thing you know, you're connecting heart to heart. And what a cool gift on Valentine's Day to do that, right? So. You know, the breathing techniques are so critical. One of my favorites for the vibration part of it is called Brahmari. And that's where you, it's just called the humming breathing technique. And studies show that that breathing technique increases the production of nitric oxide by 15 times. Nitric oxide is a Nobel Prize winning molecule, the panacea molecule in 1998, won the Nobel Prize. And it was, uh, and it's produced in the paranasal sinuses of your nose. If you breathe through your mouth, you make none of it. If you breathe through your nose, you make a lot of it. But if you breathe through your nose and hum, you make 15 times more of this curing panacea molecule, which is so critically important for our health and well-being. So that's just simply just breathing in through your nose or through ujjayi breathing through your nose and then breathing out and humming. Super simple. And if you want to enhance the vibration effect, you just plug your ears. If you do that with me, all of a sudden your whole head starts to resonate. It's just crazy. So breathe in, in and out. Your whole head, your neck, your chest, your heart, all of a sudden these guys start vibrating together and it entrains those two vib vibrations, your heart and your head. It's a beautiful technique and proven to change neuroplasticity, 
right? Crazy. So it's chanting. Buy some chanting CDs and just sing along. You know, it, it scientifically works. You know, these are tools to change your vibration. Meditation has been shown to change the telomeres in your brain, in your, in your cells, to make them longer, which are, which are indicators of no stress. And when you meditate and you get into the no stress level, you increase these biophotons I talked about earlier. They become coherent. And when your biophotons are released in a coherent fashion, they're vulnerable to intention. And that means intuition. And that means, you know, these biophotons real quick, they're being emitted out of your body and received by your body. And we're constantly communicating them from body to body to body. And they now have been shown to be unchanged by intention. And if you create coherent biophotons, they can have a positive effect on the people around you. But if you create stressed out incoherent ones, they can have a negative effect on the people around you. They did a study with monkeys and they found that it was, uh, I don't know if it was a monkey, it might have been a rodent, but they, they it was, it had some kind of cancer, it was irradiated and had a lot of radiation poisoning, um, unfortunately. And they put a healthy rodent next to it. And within just 48 hours, the rodent that was next to it had more radiation damage than the rodent that was there. And they measured the mechanism of how that happened, and it was the biophotons from the, 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 to the incoherent biophotons from the stress and the, and the oxidation of the radiation impacted the person next to it, or the, 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 the being next to it. And um, so when we meditate, we actually create a field around us of coherent biophotons. And those biophotons can be altered by our intention. So when you pray from like a deep meditative state, you actually have the ability to, to uh, um, deliver a therapeutic response at a distance, which is perhaps the mechanism for prayer, which is pretty cool and, and understand. I've written some really interesting articles about the science about that, biophoton, type in biophotons, prayer, you know, intention uh, in my website at lifespa.com and, and type in at the and, and, uh, and read some of these articles. The research on it is quite, quite fascinating and phenomenal, really. Um, so those are some techniques that can work really well. I, mean, I think the, the classic technique um, is an Ayurvedic technique called Nasya. And that's one of the five most powerful detox techniques in Ayurveda, and it's for detoxing the brain, particularly the limbs in the brain. There's limbs in the brain that go right across the top of the head like a mohawk haircut, and also the transverse sinus here, it's in the sagittal sinus here, are where the brain limbs move. And that's part of the tarpaka kapha. And the tarpaka kapha is a detox pathway uh, that is like a brainwashing fluid. It's like your cerebral spinal fluid washing through your brain, cleaning out all the junk to the tune of three pounds of plaque out of your head every year while you sleep. Yeah, three pounds of junk comes out of your head every year while you sleep. And all that junk moves through the, nas the paranasal sinuses out into the lymphatic system and then thrush detoxified out of the body. So nausea was a technique that was discovered thousands of years ago. The brain lymphatic system called the glymphatic system was only recently discovered a decade ago at the University of Virginia. Now, congestion of the brain lymphs are linked to anxiety, depression, cognitive decline, infection, inflammation, and even autoimmune concerns. From the Ayurvedic perspective, congestion of those brain limbs were old emotional trauma, of course. So they would use these nausea techniques to free people from those old traumas, to rewrite the white matter of the brain with, with, cl cl with uh, uh, clarity, uh, erase some of the old emotional traumas that were there. That's what it was for. Um, it also is great technique to clean out the brain lymphatics because of our toxic environment and poor digestion and bad lymph. The brain can get very congested with lots of tech chemicals and toxins, but the original use of it was for old emotional trauma. So I did write an article about that once uh, that's on my website. It's called uh, NASYA, N-A-S-Y-A, Sinus Cleansing and Emotional Baggage. And uh, I give you a step-by-step -step procedure of how to actually do this very elaborate process <clears throat> of cleaning out the brain lymphatics. There's a video and an article step-by-step -step how to do it. You know, I administered Pancha Karma Ayurvedic Detox for 26 years, uh, full-time. 
And that tra treatment of the nausea was the most important treatment because, you know, Panchakarma wasn't about just cleaning out your body. It was making this thing a refined instrument to perceive the truth from the non-truth, the real from the non-real. The emotion part, emotional part of you, those old unwanted emotions, from the more vulnerable, delicate, and powerful truth of you to let that out. That's what Panchakarma was for. So I used the Nasi technique to kind of unlock a lot of these old emotional blocks so they had a level of clarity and awareness to be able to say, oh, you know, I've been going through door number one, doing the same dumb stuff again and again in my life, and now all of a sudden, door number two appears. Now I can start to do something completely different. I can go down a road that lets my true self be out, taking that risk to be vulnerable, looking through the window of compassion and understanding versus judgment. This is, this is the purpose, pur one, of the, one of the purposes and, you know, and role and goal of Ayurveda is to do that. So read that article if you're interested and read about it. It's pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's a technique that is elaborate. Read it and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, give it a go. But I, if you have any health concerns or anything like that, I would definitely wait on that until you get those resolved. This technique, you want to be strong to be able to handle that. But it's powerful. You know, <clears throat> and then, of course, the, the classic way to help the body release molecules of emotion, which are stored in your fat, is to burn fat, right? And that's where Ayurveda use their ghee cleanses. You know, we have three Ayurveda cleanses that use ghee. The Colorado cleanse is our 14-day detox. Our short home cleanse is a free ebook you can download. A quick, easy, simple, quick four-day Ayurvedic detox. And our Kayakalpa five-day cleanse, which is also a free ebook. All this stuff's for free. And that tells you how to do a much deeper five-day retreat that uses the very specific uh, dosing of of macronutrients to deliver a stem cell effect. So it's about deep, deep rejuvenation, and that's tied to uh, levels of, uh, we put into that cleanse, you know, Ayurvedic self-inquiry, breathing techniques, the yoga, and of course the stem cell activation. So it's a powerful technique for deep physiological rejuvenation. It's just five days. The four day is something you can do quick, boom, work through it, no problem. And the 14 day is long. You can still work through that, but the 14 day cholesterol cleanse is our digestive reset, lymph cleanse, intestinal repair, and detox via all the old toxins from the fat cells. So that's our, our most powerful cleanse. Um, and then you have the five day retreat, Kaya Kalpa cleanse, and then the four day one. But ghee is sort of the hallmark of how these work. And it doesn't have to be ghee. If you're a vegan, you can use olive oil, coconut oil, you can use other oils, and we give you options for that. Um, in the ebooks, and again, they're free. Um, but the ghee is a key, and I'll say ghee, but ghee uses a process called lipophilic mediated detoxification. In studies, it's shown that when you put a fat into the body, the fats attract other fats and they pull them. Well, heavy metals, environmental pollutants, and environmental pesticides, you know, in 2019, 70 million tons of toxic chemicals are dumped into our environment. They end up on our food, we eat that food, you know, you got to be able to, de to detoxify that stuff. It's your digestion is your ability to detoxify. So if you have weak digestion, right, and you don't eat X, Y, and Z because you don't feel good when you eat wheat or dairy or nuts or seeds or lectins, and you just don't eat them, you haven't solved the problem. All you've done is stop eating the foods you can't digest well. The real problem is all the environmental pollutants, the mercury from the coal mine plumes, those are constantly being, you know, exposed to your digestion not processed, dumped into your lymph, dumped into your brain, dumped into your fat, causing real toxicity problems down the road. So don't be fooled. Just taking stuff out of your diet does not serve you. You gotta fix the problem. And that's why I wrote my book, Eat Wheat, and, and have written so many articles about how to do this, um, help to reboot your digestion. And of course, the Colorado Cleanse is a 14-day digestive reset, which is really important. But the ghee um, is a chelator for those heavy metals and environmental pollutants. And the studies have shown that, that uh, the, the ghee cleanses detoxify heavy metals. They get rid of pesticides and pollutants and insecticides out of your store in, deeply in your tissues. And we don't realize how much is in there. And yeah, you know, you can't fight the system because it's there, but you can make sure this digestion is really efficient and that's critical. And every once in a while, go in there and shovel out the stuff that's been stored. And that's what these ghee cleanses are truly all about. 
And when you burn fat, which is what the ghee does, and how that works is you have a bunch of ghee in the morning that forces you into this big fat burning state. Flushes your liver, flushes your gallbladder, cleans out your liver and gallbladder. Number one abdominal surgery in America today, elective, is gallbladder removal surgery. So getting your gallbladder cleaned out regularly is such a great thing to do. And then the ghee helps flush all that. Then you have no fat during the day because you had all this fat in the morning. And you have no fat during the day, your body stays in the fat burning state that you got from having so much ghee in one sitting. And when you're in fat burning during the day, all the fat cells are releasing their toxins into your system for chelation and detoxification out of your system. But also the molecules of emotion that we stored, the mental ama stored in your fat cells, they're also being released as well, which means that all of a sudden on your radar screen, particularly if you're being more settled and more self-aware during the cleanse, you know, fat is a stable fuel. Sugar is like this, up and down, up and down. But fat by definition is stable fuel. So when you're in fat burning, you're calm, you're stable. If you add meditation, yoga, breathing to that, you're even more calm. The lake becomes, the pond becomes clear. You can see more deeply into your old patterns of behavior and then see what ones are serving you and which ones aren't. And that gives you the access to, sort of like pulling back that bow, gives you a level of clarity and awareness to see door number one and door number two. Door number one, reacting to the same stress in the same old way forever. Door number two, taking that risk to be vulnerable, to be delicate, to love through compassion and understanding versus to judge. This is the goal. This is what it's all about. And the, the Ayurvedic cleanses give you, and they're designed for that, to give you the level of clarity to see the old molecules of emotion that aren't serving you any longer. So they're transformational at a much deeper level than your physical body. Physical body is really important, it has to be purified, reset, lymph has to work, digestion has to work, intestinal skin has to be strong, upper digestion has to be strong enough to break down stuff and protect you. All that delivers immunity. That's critical. But, but all that's required for that instrument to be refined enough to perceive the subtle. And that's where we're going with Ayurveda, which is such a beautiful thing. And of course, don't forget, ghee is the highest food source of butyric acid on the planet. And butyric acid is the number one fatty acid in your digestive system that feeds the, the cells of your gut, drives gut immunity, um, supports the health and integrity of all the cells that line your intestinal tract. And as we all have heard of leaky gut syndrome, the number one protector of that is butyric acid. You have microbes in your gut, literally called uh, Clostridium butyricum and others, that make ghee for a living. So it's uh, very, very important, very, very important for us to realize that ghee is inoculating our gut with a butyric acid, the food for the good bugs, to keep our whole intestinal tract happy and alive. So I encourage you to, to think about our Colorado cleanse this spring. Uh, and I also want to know that, that you know, in this regard, I, I put together a completely free four uh, video training series on detox. It's our free detox training. And we only air this every once in a while and people love it. It's four videos, sort of like this, but on a different topic, where I go deeply into the, all the aspects of detoxification. And uh, it's, a, I think, a wonderful course. It's all for free. So, and you can sign up for that now. So please sign up for that and take advantage of this free training, which is going to be coming this spring. So please check it. And it's just in a couple of weeks, actually, it starts. So, so uh, get signed up um, for that and uh, get ready. Actually, it's, not, it, it, it's uh, starting, I think, um, just in a couple of days. I think on February 9th, it starts. So, uh, so, so don't hesitate. Sign up now for the free Ayurvedic detox training and um, I hope you enjoyed this. All of the, the, the tools that I gave you today are articles and videos on my website to dive deeper into what I talked about. But I hope I inspired you to have a really great happy Valentine's Day and to use this as an opportunity to uh, interact with your partner uh, from the deepest possible place and uh, taste the water of true love. All right, you guys, thanks for listening. I'll, I'll talk to you next month. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share.
This recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.